Okay, hi Matt. Absolutely great to to have you on. I know we haven't spoken in in some times, but I do remember you very fondly from many years ago. I think I had to look. It's 2017 that yeah, you uh, that's the, uh, did, uh, did the yeah. program. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I saw you came to mind because I saw it pop up on LinkedIn yeah. that you've you've just secured a new role, um, and I know you've had a, a few since. Um, when you would graduated from the University of Birmingham. So I thought you could just tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and where are you? I can see it's, it looks a little bit warmer where you are than where I am at the moment. So, so what's going on? Sure. Um, so yes, I'm currently living in Monaco, um, working at a hedge fund here. Um, so I'm an execution trader. Um, so as you rightly said, when we first met, I was at the University of Birmingham. Um, I was an undergrad in economics. Um, and then I did the Amplify summer program at the end of my first or second year. It actually slips my mind which now I think second year. Um, and then following kind of going back to uni and completing my degree, um, I then started on the grad scheme at Credit Suisse, uh, where I was on the electronic trading desk. And then I spent three years there. Um, I think it was a year and a half in cash equities and then a year and a half in listed derivatives. And then I moved to Berenberg uh, while I was on the high touch um, cash sales trading desk. Um, I spent just over a year there. And yeah, now I'm a trader at Hedge Fund in Monaco. Wow. And th th there's a couple of terminology points there. You said high touch and you said electronic trading. Yeah, so maybe yeah. you're going in the order of reverse chronological order. So electronic trading at Credit Suisse. What, what is that? Sure. Yeah. So um, electronic trading or low touch trading, um, effectively trading through algorithms. Um, the reason why it's called low touch is you know, it does what it says on the tin. Um, the idea is that the client and also the bank slash broker um, want to get involved with the order as little as possible. It's supposed to be straight through process, seamless, um, and you can kind of give an order uh, to the bank through one of these algos and it will intelligently work it um, in the best way to, well, in a way to get the best execution um so you know it will have try to have as little impact as possible and, and not alert the market um but that's kind of very generalized there's many different algorithms that you can use um, and types of low touch trading but it's effectively kind of giving the keys more to the buy side trader and they can kind of have more autonomy um, and, and control of their, their order um whereas high touch trading again um does what it says on the tin it's very much kind of more personal um, and you'll have a sales trader who you will speak to um, and you will physically give him or her the order and again it can work in many different ways but the general high level principle is that high touch trading uh, you'll have a lot more interaction with your counterpart on the sell side um, low touch it kind of gives you more control um, and you have less interaction uh, with your broker mm. so in a, in a low touch environment where it's more algorithmic led is there to work in that area is this where it's all people who come from a mathematical background programming background or is there a blend of different people within these teams yeah it's absolutely a blend so for example you know i did economics university um which obviously is geared towards mathematics to some degree but it's certainly not a stem subject um and within the many different electronic chain desks that I've seen across the city, um, you do have that mix and it really can vary massively. The way that electronic chain desks are generally split out is that you'll have kind of a sales slash sales trader function and then you'll have a quant and development side of the business as well. And obviously they all work seamlessly, hopefully, together. Um, but the quant and the development side of the team are naturally extremely kind of um, more technical and our engineers and computer scientists and they build the product they build the algorithms they back test um the algorithms and look at data um all the time to see you know how they can improve the functionality of the algos um whereas the sales slash sales trader function obviously you need to be able to understand kind of these technical principles but you certainly don't need to have an in-depth um stem background um mm. I know, I know people who studied history um, and the arts who were working on electronic trading desk. So, um, mm. yeah. So, so going back to when you were graduating, yeah. so 
when you were first doing applications and things like that, did you have it in mind that it was trading you wanted to go into? And then how did like the Amplify experience fit within that process? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, Amplify, the Amplify experience was definitely instrumental. Um, I, I did have in my mind that I wanted to go into trading. Um, but obviously, when you're applying for internships and grad schemes, it's often branded all as one global market internship. Um, so within that, it's not necessarily going to be trading. Um, it could be sales, it could be structuring. It could be uh, research sometimes. Um, so I knew that I wanted to do some more geared towards trading, but there wasn't really an option to directly apply to you know get experience on a trading desk. And then at the time, um, my housemate had done the Amplify seminar when you guys came to Birmingham. Um, yes. Mentioned to me, he was like, "You should should definitely check out this summer program." Um, so I did. I thought, wow, that looks great. Um, so came to do that. And then kind of from there, it was it was definitely the building block, which I was able to then apply to grad schemes and further jobs from. Um, and I think what's so instrumental about what you guys do on that program is it's real world experience. And you you go away from that program able to continue your growth and journey. Um, on your own, that's certainly what I did. Um, I actually remember you telling me, uh, well, telling the class, how um, you know you recommend even if you're just paper trading, keep kind of just a blog um, and a diary of exactly what you do, what your reason are to enter a trade, what your mm-hmm. stop level, like what your take profit level is going to be, what you're looking at, what the peers doing, etc., etc., etc. So that was something which I, well, so I cut forward a bit there, but after I finished the program. Um, I was like, okay, this is definitely what I want to do for a career. And all the real world experience, and when I say real world experience, I mean actual trading experience in live markets. Um, all that experience then allowed me to take that base layer away and just continually build on it uh, when I was back at uni. Um, obviously, jumping straight into learning to trade is extremely difficult um, because it's such an alien world and there's. Um, so can you can you hear that in the background? No, no. Okay. <laughs> All um, good. Um, yeah, so jumping um, into trading is extremely hard because it's such an alien world. It was kind of quite tricky terminology and also just the barriers for entry are extremely high. So it's hard mm. to just jump in and get an understanding. And of course, there are sources of information out there, but also on the other side, there's so many sources and some of them aren't necessarily reliable. So you don't really know where to start. And Amplify really does provide that succinct package of expert knowledge which allows you to understand what is going on in the market um so like i said after i left amplify i was like okay it's definitely what i want to do so then i just continued to kind of trade my own book um and you know mm-hmm. when you say that to people people can say yeah but like we're students we don't have money to waste or potentially lose well not potentially you are going to lose money at the start uh, <laughs> But um, but you don't need to have a live account. You know, you can have a paper account. But also, you know, I, I would recommend having a live account because it makes it more real. But also, you don't have to have a large account at all. Mm. You, know, you start with like fifty quid or something. And you know, like, I don't want to sound you know out of touch to anybody at all. But most people mm. as students can can find fifty quid somewhere. Um, so mm. if you if you really want to kind of start and get going and you know. That's what you have to do. And to cut a long story short, that really was kind of the springboard to my career. So after I left Amplify and it gave me the initial knowledge to kind of go and trade myself, that meant that I just had a constant understanding of what was going on in the market because I was trading every day whilst I was at uni. So then when I went to interviews, um, I had an appreciation for what was going on. And um, that's extremely important when you apply it because as I said a minute ago, it doesn't matter if you make or lose money. What kind of recruiters want to see is that you actually have an interest and you have a sustainable interest. And I personally think the only way to really stand out amongst thousands of applicants these days, if you're applying for a bulge bracket bank role, um, is to show that you're you're kind of a self-starter and you've done something to really show that you're passionate and you want to succeed. You know, it's very easy to even if you have a stellar um spring week or internship experience at a bulge racket bank you know like that doesn't actually show that you know you're necessarily going above and beyond yeah you'd be great to get on to that but 
but mm. were, were you just a seat warmer in that situation like do you were you really engaged and the only way to really show that on your tv and to, to potential um, employers is to show what you've done off your own back so like i said after i left you guys i kind of well, straight in my own book and then keeping just um a completely personal blog it was almost just a, a blossoming not even a blog of the mm. trade blog. and then from that i actually started to build it out to more of a blog so if you know i was thinking about a trade or i'd put on a trade for a specific reason or in a specific sector then i would just kind of write a bit of a blurb about what i thought was the reason motivation for that trade um and then i just literally started sharing that on facebook to my friends to which none of them even cared slightly <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um, and which is what i expected but it was kind of just i was like okay well it's just a good exercise for me um yeah. and after doing that i then actually um started writing for this kind of online financial media startup called the market mogul um they don't yeah. actually um but i was doing that so then kind of it was just as with anything in life an incremental building block process so i went from really just keeping a trade blotter to then kind of writing a bit of a blog so then kind of writing these articles for this online uh, financial media um company um because obviously you know i just got more proficient and more involved um and understood the market more had more to say um so then even just those kind of three things that I've just described, then when I went to interviews, mm. I just had all of this kind of ex- experience to talk about. Um, and it wasn't conventional experience. It was experience which you don't need to have any connections or foot in the door, or money to do. Like, you can just do that yourself. Um, yeah. 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 And, you, and your, your background then, I mean, where, where is your hometown? Where, where are you from? There's a slight regional accent there. <laughs> I'm sensing. It's a tricky accent because I'm originally from South Wales, um, okay. but right on the border to Bristol. So it's um, that beautiful combination of a Welsh <laughs> and West Country accent, which many people aspire to. Wow. Uh, how, how many uh, South Wales border Bristol people are there in Monaco? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, have, so having worked at, um, so, you, you know, you graduated now what, four or five years ago. Now... Yeah. Looking back in retrospect to, you know, the people who will be listening to this, a lot of them are still in that undergrad phase. There's a lot of uncertainty. Obviously, we're going into an economic downturn, a recession, and there's job cuts. And, you know, this seems to be never a good time to enter the workforce. But looking back now that you've now taken a couple of steps down the path, you've worked at a few different places, what kind of like words of advice could you pass on to those people other than like kind of the practical stuff that you've shared just from a kind of motivational or a, the cultural aspects of the different places where you've worked or locations yeah and so on yeah, it's a super important question um and obviously aside from what i've already said um i think you know obviously at risk of just sounding like this is a generic answer and i will delve deeper into it to kind of justify it but networking is obviously just so important um and the reason why networking is so important is not necessarily you know like i've been super involved with the graduate recruitment process um when i was a credit suisse and when i was a baron um kind of like to the point of literally meet and greets to bring um potential spring week interns all the way through to actually training interns and graduates um, who have actually secured the job um and you know what i kind of always tell them is that and what I always see is when you go to one of these events, you'll just get hundreds of LinkedIn requests afterwards. And that's it. And people think, oh, great. Yeah, I networked. Cool. But that's not really what it's about. It's the whole point of networking is to get a sponsor. Right. And that's what everybody needs. Like everybody, every young person needs a sponsor. Even people who are more mature in their career need a sponsor. And without the sponsors that I have had, I have, would no way have gone to where I am now, like without a shadow of a doubt. And the way you kind of, meet a sponsor obviously initially through networking etc but it's to just interact them on a human level um so anybody who is going to sponsor you wants you wants really to know that you know what your true character is so just really getting to know people on a human level whether that's you know going for drinks with somebody or going for coffee or literally just having a standard chit chat with them mm. at, at the water cooler like that's 
really what you have to do, and that's really important in your career, is ultimately at the end of the day, if you're working 12 hours in the immediate vicinity of somebody, then you need to be able to get on with them. Um, and yeah, and the more you get on with them, the more successful you're going to be. And like I said, mm. you know, the sponsors that I've had in my career have 100% allowed me to move on to the next step every single time. When I left Credit Suisse to go to Berenberg, I wanted um, to go to work on a high-touch desk. And my boss at the time, who I'm still extremely close with, she gave me that platform um, and kind of gave me an understanding of all the options that I had and it allowed me to do that. And then the same thing when I left Berenberg. Um, people kind of knew that I was destined to work on the buy side instead of the sell side and I was supported to do that. Um, and, you know, if you don't have the sponsors to do that, then it just makes it extremely difficult. Um, so that's definitely a salient bit of advice, which I would just say is so, so key. Um, and then the other thing, which again, I would always kind of tell um, undergrads is that you just have to really be sure that this is exactly what you want to do. Um, and I, it's absolutely fine to not be sure and do a spring week or do an internship and say, oh, okay, fine, it's not for me. But I've seen plenty of people who do a spring week and do an internship and then get a graduate job offer and they take it and you can tell it's not for them and they kind of know it's not for them, but they stick at it, they persist and it just doesn't work because ultimately this is an industry where if you don't actually enjoy what you're doing, then it's almost impossible to do this job because it's extremely intense, the hours are long, like, like the, the hours are extremely long, you know, that's just in trading. If you're working on the investment side, then it's all, it's all, it's all, all your life is, like to, at the start at least anyway. Um, so you definitely have to be sure this is what you want to do. And this comes back to my first point of kind of being a self starter while, whilst you're at uni and getting as much experience as you can just through whether that be something as rudimentary as reading the FT or kind of reading Bloomberg's news articles or like, well, look at Twitter these days, right? Thin Twitter actually is such a huge source of news now, which the professional community uses much as the retail community. Obviously, that's partly driven by the fact that the retail community is now so inherently linked to the professional community, but everything is on Twitter. Like, like research reports are going to be on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Kind of outlook pieces are going to be on Twitter from big banks. Everything is on Twitter. Um, so, you know, you can just get stuck in there for, for absolutely free. And mm -hmm. then that will tell you whether you're interested in the industry or not by just actually having a look. Um, so, yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. It's great to hear because I think, yeah, testament to you for having that kind of curiosity to just persevere without having that kind of, I think people often have this uh, false pretense that you have to come through this very traditional path to have success, to land the role and then have success to grow within those roles. But it's not always the case, right? You can hustle to a certain degree. <laughs> and um, I mean, it's, it's a very good point. And kind of when, when I first, I kind of think of my career in London in, in two parts because that's what it was in two parts. And um, but I think I think it's like this for everybody. Um, when you work in um, Canary Wharf versus working in the city, it's it's an extremely different environment. Um, and I say this, but it's probably not a completely apples to apples comparison because obviously I was on the grad scheme when I was in Canary Wharf and the early stage of a lot of my career, and then I was a bit later on when I moved to the city, but when you join a big bank grad scheme, a lot of people have come through that traditional path. And, you know, bulge bracket banks, I think there's eight or something, right? So, like, they're a very small part of the universe. Um, but naturally, they have the biggest marketing budget. They have the biggest campus, campus recruitment budget. So that's what everybody's kind of drawn towards. So on the grad schemes there, the paths are quite linear. Um, and they are almost carbon copies of everybody else's path. Even though, to be fair, the banks are definitely trying to improve this now and, you know, reaching out to non-target unis and doing more on that side to get a more diverse pool of graduates in. But my point is, is that when I left um, Canary Wharf and I started working in the city, you realise how many opportunities have come about through the exact means that you've just said, through just hustling and working hard and, you know, finding someone who might be a sponsor for you. And I, I actually know many people who literally got trading jobs because they reached out to somebody on LinkedIn and said, can I just have a chat? Um, 
and then you know people assume that it's so hard to break into this industry but a lot of the time mm. will be looking for juniors um and it's hard to find them sometimes so it's it's never gonna it's never gonna hurt you to just reach out to somebody and say can we have a chat um because even if that chat leads to nothing in six months time they might suddenly need a junior and they're naturally going to think oh i met that person yeah they seem pretty bright pretty keen um mm. i'll tell that we've got a role now um, yeah it's like creating your own luck in a in a way yeah, and it's like there's a saying and i'm definitely not going to quote it correctly now but it's something along the lines of creating your own luck is really just you know working 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 and then you end up being in the right place at the right time and all that work we've done prior suddenly pays off but you just mm. need to wait to come and there's no such thing as just straight luck you always influence the luck that you're going to get um yeah yeah all right for final questions just to wrap up is that i know maybe a, a few people watching this might think so doing the role that you do and as you've explained what would yeah. be the skill set that you have so yeah. that if they were to assimilate a similar path what do they need to focus on yeah um, so i would actually say that my number one kind of most necessary skill is just being able to read um and i know from other traders um and when I say other traders, I don't even mean execution traders, I mean alpha generation traders. Um, like many people quote that um, because ultimately this game is just a game of knowledge, right? You have to know more than somebody else to, you need to know more than the other person who's on the other side of your trade effectively if you want to win in that trade. And the only way you kind of assimilate that knowledge is through reading. Um, and that can be, you know, immediate news, like a red headline on Bloomberg, an article, or a research report from a bank or anything on Twitter. Um, or a short seller report or anything. Um, but that's the key point. There's value to be found in so many different sources of news these days that you need to quickly be able to run through something and run a comprehension on it and digest that and have an opinion on that. Um, and it's just so important. And the more you read and the more news sources and you can see, then the more likely to you're more likely you are to be successful. Um, and also, you know, like I just said a minute ago, it's not even just the immediacy of reading something and acting on it. It's about just understanding the whole network of the market and the contextual nuances of the market. And again, you only learn that from reading, reading about them, whether, you know, it's obviously people are comparing the situation in the market today and the inflation scenario to what happened in the 70s. And there's great value to just looking back at financial and economic history and seeing how that played out and seeing how the Fed reacted and seeing you know how the Fed might have done this better or done this wrong and but when they did this wrong this happened and you know mm -hmm. history doesn't repeat but it often does rhyme um, and you've seen myriad graphs in the last kind of year of people comparing the market today to 2001 and 2002 and you know there are big similar similarities to be seen. Um, so it's just having that constant awareness of what's going on, what's going on, what's, what's happened before, what's going on now, and then hopefully inferring from that what's going to happen in the future. Um, so reading is definitely kind of my number one tip. And then number two is kind of more of a soft skill, but, um, and I saw that Ray Dalio actually said this, but to be a good trader, you have to be resilient because you're going to get hurt. You're going to get cut up pretty bad uh, a lot um, before it starts getting better. And, you know, as with many things in the market, people always end up selling at the bottom. So, you know, when you're in the darkest hour and you think, oh, this just isn't for me, I cannot get this right. You just have to do that and have that resilience. Um, and that's what is that, is that resilience did you have that resilience already because i know you used to play a lot of sport when you were younger so is that from that or can you learn resilience no you can definitely learn resilience but again i i'm personally of the opinion that you can learn anything um if you kind of have just the right dedication and and the work ethic um and this brings me back to my point of what i said earlier you have to actually want to do this and you have to actually enjoy this because if you go then it's super hard to be resilient because you're like, oh, I don't even really enjoy that this much. So what's the point? Um, whereas if you know for certain that this is what you want to do and you're absolutely sure of that, then it's almost like you don't have another choice. Like it doesn't matter how bad it gets. 
um, how much money you might lose or how stupid you feel because of the decision you've made, you're like, well, there are no other options. This is exactly what I want to do with my life. So I just have to get up and go again. Um, mm. Mm. That's it. Cool. Well, look, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. It's been a, a pleasure to uh, catch up with you. It's amazing yeah. to see the success you, you continue to have. And I know there's many more turns in the road, I'm sure, to come. But thank you very much for taking the time out to speak to people who were exactly like you were um, a few years back. So it's so valuable, I think, for them to see, you know, success in, in different ways. So thank you, Matt. Thank you. All right.